thanks for the introduction. And um, I'm perhaps overly excited about this, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, so I've been at Pixworthy for not too long now, but for me this is a really good next step. So I'm really excited about drones and everything that's possible there because I came from traditional aerial photography. But we were trying to do super high resolution, which meant me in a plane like way too close to the treetops. Um, so it's really in that same overlap zone what I was trying to do 15 years ago. Um, after that, I went to Autodesk for a long time where I worked on with big customers on their really big infrastructure projects, um, especially on the civil side. So that's kind of my, my influence on all of this stuff. And then now that I've been at Pix4D for a bit, we've been talking with a lot of people about kind of the whole workflow, the whole picture, and all the different pieces that you get from Mapper, so Pix4D Mapper. So if you think about surveying and all the different things it could be, in the end, you know, as a digital surveyor, and one way or another, I think you're all digital surveyors, um, you need to record the right details digitally from all these various outputs that you get. And it also needs to be manageable. So one thing that we've done, kind of historically in a lot of different parts of the data collection side of the industry, whether it's laser scanning or photogrammetry, is we've made it super easy to create a ton, ton, ton of data. So you're going out there, you're capturing, that all works nicely with the tools you've got. You can process that into all these beautiful 3D outputs, you know, point clouds of all different sizes. But when you get into design and kind of confirming that that's everything that you need, and then even down the road, the, the maintenance side of it, you don't need 500 million points in the point cloud or anything like that. It needs to be the right data. So what's happened is, instead of this being a nice, kind of smooth arc, if you look at the whole workflow, you know, you guys are smart, you've figured out how to make stuff work, but that doesn't mean it's pretty, you know? Like, we just want to make it a bit easier for you and kind of, you know, because you're smart and you figured it out, it doesn't mean you want to spend your time doing all this data massaging and stuff in the middle. So we just want to hopefully make it a bit easier for you. So, and why is it important? And this is where, um, Chris Anderson's stuff really fit well with what I'm thinking about because it's ideally it's not a one-time thing, right? You're out there, you know, like with crane camera, they're doing stuff day after day with that same arc, but why not do it for those linear projects for airports, for roads and rails, and all kinds of other stuff. It's always really good to have more data and to be able to do it efficiently to process it. You don't want to be flying for a day, processing for a day, cleaning for three, and then finally see your output a week later. Um, so there's that, that gap, and it's it's because of big sets of images, it's because of ortho mosaics and DTMs are all getting bigger, and you all want more detail, of course. And then point clouds. Has anybody ever, with Mapper, ended up with a point cloud that was like 200, 250 million points in the end? Okay. And, uh, and then you start getting into all these fun things like sneaker net to share files, right, or FedEx, and um, there's, what we're trying for with surveys to make it easier to decimate, to simplify, to get the right information at the right time. Another thing that's happening more and more is merged data sets. You know, maybe you're doing a rehab project. You need to get some interior stuff. You need really great detail on the facade. You need um, who knows? Like even for a, a project that's like a complete site rehab, you might want to really pull in that scan of your interior space with all this amazing complexity that you get in the real world. But you want to be able to see that in the context of your whole site, so with your, all your stuff outside. So bringing that all together is kind of key to being able to really work the way you want to work. Um, and then there's these disconnected workflows. So there's a million products and a hundred different software companies giving them to you. We just want to kind of make it easy. So the survey's not going to take over the whole world. We, we just want to make it easier to get it into the tools that you're using and, uh, and save you some time along the way. So. That's, that's where we're at. So we're not going to do your planning and design, but we want to be able to get you the right pieces of data as you work with all the great detail that you have in your photogrammetry and be able to leverage it all the way through. Um, okay, so if we come back to the to pick for the terms. So today you're going out, you're acquiring, you're doing your processing in Mapper, and then eventually you, your client, whoever, needs to get it in CAD and GIS, and it's this, two-thirds of the time. I routinely talk to people who spend like 
a learning climb and three days doing things like removing noise and getting the right classification and things like that. So I think what I'll, I'll show you in survey, hopefully that'll help you uh, speed it up a bit. So for me, what matters? Um, accuracy, I think it's pretty important for anybody who's calling them a cell as a surveyor, whether you're an engineer or any, where we might work in that kind of surveying flow. Um, getting the right details, because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't matter so much. Coordinate systems. Um, is there anybody here who doesn't care about coordinate systems? No? All right, cool. That surveyors are just fun like that, right? So, um, and then the right tools. So for me, we, we've got some great plans for coordinate systems and vertical datums, all kinds of really getting a complete set of it, the ability to customize and, and really move beyond into the full set of possibilities. Um, some of it's going to take longer than others, but there's there's a lot of great things that we're working on. Um, otherwise, our objectives, I think I've covered a lot of this already. For me, I think it's expanding possibilities. Um, one thing I run into a lot is everybody kind of in the end has the same basic set of needs when you come to what the outputs should be, but depending on how much time you've been able to invest in the learning curve of making everything work right, I think um, by giving you a tool like Survey, it'll be just easier to do more things. So you can expand your business into some, some new directions, maybe a new niche, and um, just give your customers the stuff they want a bit faster. So it's not gonna do your photogrammetry needs. We're, we're gonna take your either external point cloud or your mapper file and bring that in. So the photogrammetry part is already done. You've probably taken the user project you've already got. And we're not gonna do the detailed design. We're never gonna be a MicroStation, a, a Civil 3D, whatever other kind of design tool you might use, or a full GIS. You know, we're not QGIS, we're not ArcGIS. We're, we're never going to be. Um, but you don't need that. You already have it. Um, faster, better, efficienter, efficienter, more efficient, and uh, just easier to get the right stuff out there. So that's our, our basic story. It's kind of simplicity and ease. Now um, I'm going to trying to do a live demo here. So uh, let's see if survey cooperates for just a minute. I just want to show you that it's not um, smoke and mirrors. And then I've got a few videos that I promise don't have smoke and mirrors, but um, it's a lot easier to get it recorded. All right, so sorry, let me just slide this over so you can see it. And then we'll, we'll be on our way. So there's that. So that's survey. Um, if you already got the email asking you to, uh, if you're interested in signing up to join the beta, this is the, the version that uh, once you fill out the little questionnaire, I'll, I'll send you an email with a link to this, the same version we've got here. So this is the real deal. And it's super easy to get going. So if you look here, I don't know if you can actually see that. You know, that's a mapper project. You've probably seen that XWERTY mapper file structure a lot. You can really easily get started. Just drag in your P4D. Give it a few seconds. This is a pretty good sized project. Um, once it comes up there, you can see it's actually loading it all in. Unfortunately, that's uh, just far enough away. So 670 images. And what you're looking at there in the main screen, actually, just move over. Um, so that's your, your point cloud. So already you can see you've got all the detail that you might need in there to be able to start to do your basic work. So if we come in here, for example, I'm not going to do too much. It's slow, I know. But um, what, what Survey's got for you at the moment is a couple of basic tools here. So uh, it shows up well enough, but polylines, catenaries, um, polygons, and then points. So just think of them. It's, it's basic stuff in its early days for us, but you're going to be able to do your basic vectorization. If I'm really lucky here, it'll cooperate and let me do a little like uh, curve and gutter almost. It's a funny little island thing here. But you can see we're doing 3D shapes from the beginning, and it's always going to be all 3D because, I mean, whether you're going out to a CAD or a GIS, you're going to want it to be real true 3D. It's not, there's no point from my perspective letting you start off in, in 2D and having to convert later or anything like that. And you can see here, I kind of messed this up. Um, we've also got layers, if anybody ever uses different layers. Um, when you export, it'll keep your layer naming and bring everything along. So, and you can do your basic editing. So it's, in terms of ease of use, I think it's pretty good. Um, again, it's not a cat, but it's gonna move you in the direction of being able to uh, do the things that you, you wanna do. So, super basic. I'll show you some fancier stuff in the video, just because I know I'm uh, better at 
running a video than demoing efficiently. Um, let me show you that next one. So next up, so that was just a pure macro project that just came in and just worked, um, which is kind of the idea. We want to make it easy for you. Um, if we take a look here, oh, oh interesting. I always know what I wanted. Um, one sec. Uh, let me get back to the right slide. I won't hit that button. Um, okay, so here we go. Wait, is it blank? Yes. So this is a little kind of a subdivision kind of a project here. You can see I already vectorized in a bunch of stuff. This is playing double time. I just want to show you more about the layers. So, you know, you need to be able to see what you're doing and be able to get the right information. So here I was just quickly vectorizing in the boundaries of this bit of road. You can see I already vectorized in the um, fence posts along the way. There's some, some roofs in the background there. And for me, what's, what's nice here is we've got some initial properties for you that are, that are already there and they're already live. So you can use that as a little bit of initial feedback to understand whether or not the di first digitizing that you've done is actually what you need. So we're gonna move towards things like grapevines where we'll be able to fix those Z values or even fix the elevations of your individual vertices. But you can see here, you can look at the overall object properties and kind of start to understand what's happening there before even having to um, get into the individual vertices. You can see if things are all fitting. You're able to do some snapping so you get clean edges. And all of this is going to carry through directly to the next point. So what I'm doing here is actually snapping to the same point in the point cloud that was a vertex in the uh, a vertex in the, the polygon for the road as we use for the, the edges. The other thing you can do is copy paste directly out of the properties. So if you ever find yourself just having to grab a, a number or something and pass it off to your surveyor, pass it off to an engineer who just wants to know like a specific corner point, you can do that. You can also really easily verify that you're at the right spot. Um, now, this one, okay, hey, that's just plain. So here, this is, um, someone had asked about other point clouds. So this is an LAZ, this is from the state of Utah, one of their um, public data sets. So this one, there's no photogrammetry in here at all. So what you can see I've done here is I just pulled in that point cloud. There are some transmission lines, both foreground and background in here. And just doing a really quick initial vectorizing of those. So it's truly a catenary tool. It's gravity aware. It will always fit that um, proper arc. So it adjusts a bit for how you might have different tension on a line, things like that. But despite the icon looking a little bit like it could be a curve, it's not. It's a, it's always going to sag down. Um, what I showed you briefly there was it's exporting with a companion file that has all the coordinate system details. And then if you're a Civil 3D user here, I brought it into Civil, just colorized everything the same. You can see we have the right 3D geometry. And then that is, actually, should have included that a little bit. Um, that's my recording tool. Um, I thought that was out of there. If we, if we were to go back a few seconds, you could also see that in Civil 3D it had the um, the coordinate system was aligned, so everything actually dropped into the right space in the, um, there's that geomap tool in Civil if you ever use it, so it puts it against the Bing imagery, so you can really quickly verify that everything's come through properly from your, whether it was a macro project or a laser scan or LIDAR, whatever you want to call it, all the way through, all in the right coordinate system the whole time. And one last one minute video. Um, this is an example of merging mapper plus um, that's x 4 mapper plus a um, aerial LiDAR. So I pulled in my mapper project. It's something like, what, 400 images? You can see that up in the corner there of the screen. And you can see there's really deep shadows here. So we didn't actually get a good photogrammetric model out of that space down in the shadows. And what I have, though, is this aerial LiDAR. And um, you just confirm that everything's in the same coordinate system. And all these green points are actually coming directly from the LiDAR. And you can see I can pick on a point, and uh, here, quick pause that. So there's a, I've picked a point in the point cloud here, and you see these um, the crosses in the 2D imagery. So we've got a really good understanding, because of the ray cloud that comes from Mapper, of how to be able to connect the point cloud and the images. So you're able to work seamlessly, whether it's off in the case of a merge project like this, whether you're coming from a point cloud 
from Pixberry Mapper or you're coming from a point cloud that came from any other source. So as long as all the geospatial information is there and in place, you can really use them seamlessly. And you're going to see a lot more stuff happening in the 2D side here as we work towards getting an even tighter connection so you can start to really get your, your details sorted out there. So um, to, if, if anybody wants to see more of this stuff later on about how we can um, start to merge all of this, that would be more than happy to show it. But it's, it's a really nice way to take full advantage of everything that's already been processed out in, in Pixar and Mapper. Um, so what's next? Survey tools, which means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. For me, that's kind of being able to do the same job that you would do in the field, going out and taking physical measurements, but doing it from your point cloud, doing it directly inside a survey. So maybe as a preliminary step to do a little less field work, maybe just to be able to go to the field once and be done. Um, automation, again, could be a lot of different things. Um, and that's where I particularly want to hear where you all are suffering, um, where you're losing time, where you need to uh, be a little bit more efficient. Expanded compatibility, that's really all about file formats. Um, everybody's got your own workflow, and we want to be able to give you the right pieces of information to make all of that be really smooth and efficient for our NIST systems. And then finally, um, quick file cleanup. So just being able to get only the information that you need onto the red the next step of that. So for some people, cleanup is removing trees. Some people want to keep every little tree and just remove noise. Um, who knows? But we've got some really good stuff in the pipeline there as well. And then um, that's the place to go. So if you want to give it a try, go to pixbrookie.com slash survey. You might have gotten an email an hour or two ago um, announcing the Pixbrookie beta that'll have that same link in there. Um, and there's a, there's a form there, and so fill out that form, let us know what you're interested in, what you would really need for your engineering stack to have, really have faith in your photogrammetric results, um, what you need in terms of being able to register different kinds of data sources to each other, and um, just kind of what you want to see next. And then while we're here, take advantage of me being here, and then we've got Zeta back there underneath where it says Parami Pueblo. Um, and she's our user experience expert. So she is set up down on the first floor. And um, there's a, if you want to book some time with her, you can do that and get a demo. Or if you just catch me, I've got a survey on my machine, I can show you some other stuff. And, uh, and we're both more than happy to take any feedback from you guys. So that's, that's it for me. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Nate. That was fantastic. Uh, you know, I'm not a surveyor, but I just find it fascinating the workflow, and, and I, I, I hear this all the time. You know, Mapper. You know, the whole concept again is we create amazing amounts of accurate data with our Pixbury Mapper product, and then somehow it has to get into CAD. It's the workflow that that's the real key. So um, again, you can see a demonstration downstairs with the user experience. I think you have to sign up for that. Yep down in the first floor, but if you want to get some real hands-on and play with it here, that's the way to do it, and then sign up for the beta if, you're, if you've got an uh, interest in the feedback. Great, okay, so um, the next up, we have Jeff Muller from our Pix40 team in, let me switch his head, there we go. Uh, and Jeff is the director of our, our platform development group, which is uh, actually the majority of the products at Pix40 out of Switzerland. So, you know, we've been talking about, in many cases, processing, producing data, accuracy, and so forth. But more and more, we're finding the value is not in the data, but it's what you can derive from the data. And, and more and more people, or I've already had like six people say, what about machine learning? What about uh, you know, automatic detection of this or that? So, Jeff has a team working on machine learning. And, you know, there's a whole slew of use cases, but in the end, we all kind of recognize this is the intermediate step. You fly the drone, you collect the imagery, you produce data, the value is the next step, right? And that's what Jeff's going to talk to us about. Thanks, Hello, Chris. <laughs> okay, so first a little bit about me. I'm, I'm new to the world of photogrammetry. I, I joined the company nine months ago. Uh, before that, I was with the um, one of the largest research projects in, in Europe called the um, Human Brain Project. 
and there I was doing platform architecture and development as well. Uh, the goal of the Human Brain Project is to is to map and understand and model the human brain. Uh, and they do a bit of that, and they do a lot of other things. And I came, but before that, I came from the private sector. I was doing fleet tracking and logistics, um, all kinds of uh, computer vision development, and sonar and radar, sonar and radar imaging pro processing. And so for me, it was really coming back to my roots a little bit to be in a, a space like Pix4D. E. And it's an amazing, cool, cool company. I, I'm, I love my, I love coming to work every day. Um, but to say a little bit more about this, um, the platform unit at Pix4D is quite large, and so this is just one of the groups that I manage, um, and it's a team of eight guys uh, under the leadership of a, a distinguished scientist from uh, CERN, where the Large Hadron Fighter uh, is, um, and where the Higgs boson was discovered. And so we've, got, we've been able to build, since I arrived, what I would say is a fairly nice uh, machine learning team. I'll say a little bit more about why machine learning is, at Pix4D is different than at uh, Google or somewhere else. Um, we have a very specific focus um, in line with what Chris was saying about really taking those, those outputs that you're using and making it a little bit easier to do things that you want to do on a regular basis and making it possible to, to just do it a lot easier. So one thing about Pix4D that I quite appreciate is, and this is also with my experience in a scientific project. So data, this is actually one of our values, it's on our website, data is our lifeblood. So trust where the data is what we produce, it's what our brand is built on. Um, but you're going beyond that, as Chris said, you want to be able to also make good decisions, and for that you need good analytics that are, one, based on great data, but also are really trustworthy. So sometimes this takes a little bit longer to roll out than you would like. Uh, validation is a very big part of the work we do. Um, so bear with us. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with machine learning, I'll talk a little bit at a very, very, very high level about what we do at Pix4D and what machine learning is in general. So I started software development back in the 80s, and back then AI was something different. It was HAL, it was Terminator, it was really human, human AI, which is now today called artificial, or sorry, uh, general artificial intelligence. And this is what's called artificial intelligence, and the reality is there's not that much that's artificial about it. It really all comes from people. And so at the top level here you have uh, designing and training the model. This is really all about an expert who understands architectures that can be used to train efficiently, that can have good, good um, convergence behavior during the training algorithms, speeding up training. Once you actually have a model that's doing what you think it needs to do, you test and deploy it, and then usually at that point you find out that you screwed something up, you get some user feedback, and you repeat the loop. Um, most of the research that's going into AI today is really around this reducing training time and on looking at architectures that, that, can, that can either behave really well under certain circumstances or, well, or models that can actually transfer from one system to another system. So they actually might be trained on one type of model and be able to transfer that learning to another type of model, sort of working on maybe on uh, cat recognition for a common example, and being able to transfer that understanding to also be able to understand how to play chess, for example. Hard, very, very hard problem. Smarter people than us are working on that. Um, but what we're focused on at Pix4D is actually this. So, um, Pix4D historically is focused on one and two, and um, the, the analytics team is actually involved a little bit in step two, which is asset generation. Uh, so point cloud that's uh, classification um, is an input to some of the other uh, algorithms that we use. Uh, but really it's about leveraging advanced analytics to make your job easier, and really in this last step here, machine uh, learning and AI algorithms for really being able to do additional analytics. Um, why, do, why this matters? So again, as, as we've seen in our previous uh, speaker, huge, huge amounts of data are being generated. This is only going to scale. When you start, start to talk about drone automation, you're going to see data just flowing in in a way that we can't deal with at this point, so automation is key. Uh, to be able to extract insight from those at scale is not something you can put an army of people on anymore. It just doesn't work. Um, and really, machine learning is about taking that, the human intelligence and actually scaling it up, um, taking the, the intelligence that was learned for, during the training process and then deploying that at a wider scale. Um, and then also, it's about improving user, our users' workflows. So there, we know there are key pain points, you know, common failings in, in, the, in, the, in different parts of the pro point cloud processing that we think we can improve on to make everybody's life a little bit easier and to make the workflows faster. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Pix4D in this context is that we do actually have a unique strength. One of the 
you know, we have a really solid background in computer vision, and being able to pull together the 3D representations, the computer vision representations, and the machine learning together in one team makes it so that we can do some very interesting stuff. The difference in our challenge actually is that we really are focused, let's say, more on on specific accuracy. So the problems are a little bit different than you find in traditional traditional computer vision problems, or sorry, traditional uh, machine learning problems. Um, so I'm going to show you a few use cases. One thing I would say about these is some of them are nearing the market. There are a lot of them are kind of in their early phases. Um, they, in some cases, I'll point to the ones in particular. I'd actually like to get some feedback from people here who might be interested in using them somewhere, or on helping us to understand a little bit better where they make sense. So uh, I'm looking forward to having people come up to me in, after the talk and, and asking questions about them, find out where they're potentially applicable, where would uh, potentially help us to test some of them, bring us, bring us some data sets that can break them where we fail. That's always great. Um, so keep that in mind when you see all of these. I won't give you any specific timelines on when they'll be available or in what products, with one exception. But, uh, and that's really more of a focus than a specific release plan at this point. Um, so here we're talking about some use cases and some example scenarios. This one actually everybody knows. This is in Mapper today. Um, and in principle, you might not be using this tool, but on some level we actually know, based on the, the, the data we get from our application, that approximately 10 percent of macro projects that are processed use this tool. So they, they all enable point cloud classification, so on some level they're interested in this. Um, we don't know exactly what they do with it after that. But based on what we know, or what it was originally designed for, it's there to improve DTM generation, um, and it's there as well to uh, provide an initial state for user-specific annotations. Um, then another use case that we're working on is uh, we're, we're quite interested in actually reducing the, or increasing automation for GCP recognition. And so really you here, this is about substantially reducing the manual operation of GCP um, selection because we really are targeting uh, high volume, um, high volume uses, places where you want to be able to repeatedly um, gather GCPs without any kind of human intervention. Um, and really here, the initial focus from my standpoint is on uh, integration for by the, our large customers, so our engine customers, people that are using the cloud, either in an engine capacity or directly. And to give you a little bit of an idea of how that works, we start up with a GCP marking the same way you would in a, in a traditional mapper project. We have the imagery, we run a collection of, um, of a phased approach, ML detection, and then we go through a geometric refinement and we spit out a GCP, a, a precise GCP in the format that mapper understands. And you can see some examples here, dealing and trading across a wide variety of scenes, really trying to make it that it's robust in a wide variety, a wide number of scenarios. We have a limited number of targets that we've trained on at this point, but that will be improved. Um, and actually, we've got, another, we've got additional targets going in all the time. And so, actually, so going back, um, this one, I mean, I would say this one is getting ready, it's getting close. We've gone through a deep validation phase on this one. Um, I'm hoping to have something out based on this fairly soon. This is something a little bit more in the early development phase. So we have a fields product that was kind of our inspiration for looking at this. And we started to realize that um, some of the analytics that were needed didn't exist in our application, or we couldn't find them off the shelf anywhere else. And so the, the ML group started working on some of these tools. And one of the low-hanging fruit, pun intended, was uh, tree detection, um, tree diameter detection and really precise positioning and counting of trees and mapping of canopy size. Um, this can be useful in order of its states, so you can see an early version of the algorithm here, pinpointing the location of all the trees in this uh, small area. And going from an RGB mosaic to a bunch of individual detections, you can see there's a few issues there. This is an early version of the algorithm. It's much better now. And this is leading to a canopy vegetation index, which is one of the outputs of this, this system. But another thing that we can do with it is we can also point to a tree diameter map. And we've talked to some people. Some people are interested in this stuff. Other people want additional things. Um, in particular, this is one of the ones where if you, if you see some value or are interested in using this widely, uh, I'd love to talk to you. So come up and talk to me after. Um, moving on to something that is similar, but a little bit different than what you've seen before. Uh, 
we were looking into an antenna detection and pose estimation, and really about taking a look at a cell phone tower and being able to identify where, which, um, uh, which antennas are there and the exact pose of them. This is necessary for many, many use cases in the telephone inspection sector, um, but to do this in a fully automated way. And so you can see here the workflow, at least this is a, an artist's conception of the workflow. Um, so you have your cell phone tower, your pics where you scan the cell phone tower, you've isolated the area of interest, and you've pulled out the antennas of interest. And in this case, obviously there are other, there's other equipment on the, uh, the, the antenna head that's interesting, but in this case we've selected specifically for this class of geometry. So with this you have a sense that we can, we're starting to progress in terms of, uh, in terms of what we can do here. These will, this is also targeted at a certain class of products, but um, I won't say much more on that at this point. And then finally, um, I'm quite happy that the crane camera has been gotten a lot of attention here, because I think it's one of our cooler, cooler pieces of technology. Um, but one of the things about the crane camera is that it is intended to run in this fully automated way. So it's a similar, um, similar scenario to what was uh, being discussed earlier. But really the idea is you have it on, a, if you're not familiar with the idea, it sits on a crane head, and it goes around the site, and you, at the end of the day, you get a full scan of the site. And you can sort of control the, the frequency at which it scans. But you can still, um, because the images are captured automatically, because they're uploaded automatically, and because they're processed automatically, there is a possibility that some, um, some point cloud artifacts can show up. And one of the ones that we see in some of our test cases is this type of scenario, where you have the imagery here, you see where the, where the, the the image, you have some occlusion from part of the crane head, and you can't see the, the, um, the site that's actually the, just the site of interest. And so the idea here is that we, we go through and with a machine learning algorithm, algorithm that's been trained, we build a filter mask, and then we use that in the processing. You can see. So you can see here the, the resulting mosaic with, with, sorry, without filtering and with, and the improvement is quite substantial. And from the standpoint of an automated workflow, this is a really big improvement. So that's, well, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'd like to say that, I'd just like to re restate, um, please if you have any ideas or if you'd be interested in looking at early versions of these, these types of algorithms, we'd like to be in the, in the early releases of them. If you'd like to send us data that we can evaluate the algorithm with, come and talk to me. It would be a really big help and it would help us get them out to market faster.